Hello, welcome to Going Deeper. My name is Marcy Sklove, and this is part two of my interview with Paula Green, the founder of the Karuna Center for Peace Building. Um, so we've been talking a lot about Kentucky and the, the big sort of wonderful exchange that's been happening with Levert in Kentucky. And uh, I, I think we'll get back to hearing more about your work, but I wanted to start this this segment, hearing more about you and in your childhood, in your early life, what about that? What seeds were planted back then that kind of set the tone for you to be doing this work you're doing now? Well, I would say some things were planted and some things were definitely not planted. Mm -hmm. And some things that I do were things that were not done in my home okay. and vice versa. So I would say on the positive side, I came from a progressive family. My father was an activist. He was involved and he was a teacher. He was involved in teachers union mm -hmm. and Democrat. He was, he was very left wing thinking. They were all Democrats in my family. So mm -hmm. there was kind of a good political activity, but there was not much psychological knowledge. Mm -hmm. There was not much psychological intimacy between parents and children or in the extended family. So I think when I first went into this work, I was studying psychology, and I'm sure I was trying to figure out myself and my family, which mm -hmm. is why I think many young people sure. go into this work. Um, we lived in an ethnically mixed neighborhood, and my brother and I used to joke that the definition of being a grandmother was having an accent because all the grandmothers had accents. It was yeah. all, we were all first and second gen generation, um, people from, mostly from Europe, yeah. um, with the old people having come as, as adults old enough to still have accents living in the mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. And there was a kind of, I think, tolerance of difference because there were all these different people, different ethnicities getting along and living together. Yeah. In an inner city. This was in New Jersey. Newark, in Newark, in New Jersey. Newark. Yeah. Okay, in Newark, so you were yeah. in the city. I was of in Newark. the city. It was in the oh, city. Interesting. And we lived in a little two-family house that was owned by a Ukrainian family, yeah. Christian family, and our family was Jewish, although not very religious. Yeah. And uh, people got along with each other. Yeah. It was. It was. Uh, that was a very good thing that happened for me. Yeah. So I think I learned some positive things about group relations and being with others across differences. But I think I didn't learn very much about the psychological side of life or the intimacy mm -hmm. side, and I mm -hmm. had to develop that as an adult. Wow. And what about your spiritual journey? What, what? Well, my, my parents were raised Jewish. My father was kind of reactive and was reacting against Judaism, so he became a sort of a soft communist, I would say, mm -hmm. and anti-religious. And my brother, in reaction to my father, became very religious. Uh -huh. So there were some religious wars going on in the household. Wow. I yeah. was more interested in being a teenager than I was in being religious. Yeah. And I was not drawn to synagogue or to prayer or to any of that. So my brother majored in that department, and I majored yeah. in being a teenager. <laughs> and um, when I grew up, I was, guess I was in my 30s, I went first um, to a Hindu retreat mm -hmm. and then got into Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So I had a search for some sort of spirituality. But as with many people in my generation, I was moving away from the religion of my sure. birth into yeah. Eastern spirituality. Yeah. And I found a very good home for myself in um, Insight Meditation Society oh, okay. in Barry, Mass, in mm -hmm. Buddhism because the people who were teaching it were American. They happened to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. One of them was a psychologist, and that's oh, what I was studying at the time. Which, who's that? Jack Hornfield. Okay. And they spoke a language that I understood. Yeah. A spiritual language that I understood, right. and that made sense for me. And it was also, it was spirituality, but it was also spirituality and personal development. Yeah. And I think that was right for my young adult self right, and my own right. needs. So that became a, a very good home for me for a very long time mm -hmm. and a place of practice. And it's, it's carried meaningfully for me into my older years. 
Wow. Yeah, and it makes sense too that when I think of Buddhism, one of the things that I think of is the lack of the divine mm -hmm. in Buddhism. And uh, it sounds like that also kind of was a good fit for you. Mm -hmm. You know. Yes, it fit me very well. Of course, there are Buddhists in Myanmar right now who are trying very hard to make divides and to separate themselves from other people. Uh, yeah. But the, the fundamental teachings of Buddhism are yeah. more about unity and not at all about divides. Right. That, that's kind of a perversion wow. of what the real teachings are. So it fit me, it fit me very well. Yeah. And the teachings, the learnings, the insights, I've carried all my life. Mm. And they've continued to serve me. So like what? What are some well, of them? like impermanence, mm, you know, which is okay. a fundamental teaching of Buddhism, and sure. and you know we all want to grasp and cling and hold on to things, and it's it's delusional. We can't. Right. So understanding that everything is in flow and everything changes, and what's now is not going to be what's in the future, what yeah. was in the past, makes for a very sane living. Yeah. There's a lot less grasping. Wow, that's You know, and a lot of understanding that this is all in impermanent flow and yeah. everything changes. Yeah. And my life has been lived that way and mm -hmm. that's been very gratifying. Mm -hmm. And of course the word Karuna, which is the name of the organization, means compassion. Mm -hmm. And I chose that name consciously yeah. and a, a tremendous amount of teaching about compassion. Yeah, yeah. And that also is um, deeply impacted in my work. Right. Because my work is all about fostering compassion and empathy right. and, and metta, right. which is loving kindness for sure. people. So it's all, it's all had a lot of meaning for me. And do you have a daily practice? Not anymore. Okay. I used to have a daily practice. Yeah. Now I'm s slipped away from a daily practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometime I think I'm going to get back to it, but yeah. life moves forward and doesn't move backward. Right. Right. And right. so what I've got is an internalized practice, That's an internalized right. awareness. And you have, you have it in your back pocket whenever you I have it, you I want have it. it and I use it. I use it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. Even when I'm when I'm working in difficult situations with people, we'll just stop and focus on the breath and do a little meditation and just sink back down into another reality. Right. It's, I did that in Burma last week. It was very useful. Yeah. I didn't call it Buddhism. It wasn't Buddhism. Sure. It was mindfulness, to use the current yeah. buzzword. Yeah, that is <laughs> yeah. that is yeah. the current buzzword. So, so I'm grateful for I'm grateful for that history. Yeah, yeah. Um, so locally. We have the beloved Peace Pagoda. We do. New England Peace Pagoda. <laughs> and have you been involved in that from the very oh, beginning? Oh, from the very get-go. Oh, gosh. Uh, from the very get-go. They bought land two miles from my house yeah. just after I had moved here. Oh. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be nice to have a spiritual community around here? Yeah. And then they popped in from outer space, it <laughs> felt like. And I went to the very first meeting um, mm. which was held at town hall and was quite contentious because there were a lot oh, of people right. in town who were very frightened by these little guys with shaved heads and orange robes and yeah, yeah. brown skin and didn't want them here. And, and I went up afterwards and introduced myself to them and said, I live in the neighborhood. If you need anything, please call me. Oh. And two days later, my phone rang yeah. and it was Sister Claire. Yeah. <laughs> Can we come for tea? And oh. that was the beginning of a now... 35-year relationship. That's amazing. Yeah. I happened to be with them this past weekend, which was the 30th anniversary of the fire of the... The temple. The, the temple. first temple. Yeah. I didn't realize that. And it was very moving that they brought it up. We mm -hmm. were in a gathering. Yeah. Um, but it, so much has happened through, yeah. through them. So mm -hmm. much healing. Yes, Looking at history and different different, very difficult mm -hmm. histories yeah. and going back to those places mm -hmm. and lots of healing. Yeah. So what are some of the other projects? Um, I'm thinking of like difficult areas in life and I have recently interviewed uh, Rabbi Ben Weiner from the JCA and uh -huh. we talked a lot about um, Israel and Palestine. Uh -huh. Is that still a project Karuna is Oh, it is. It on? is. I, can and, you tell us about a, that? One? I can tie it into Rabbi Weiner also. Sure. Um, I've been working in Israel and Palestine for many, many years and through Karuna Center. Yeah. And this is another place where Karuna Center has asked me to carry on the work because the other people on staff have not worked in that region. Right. And for the past five years, I've been working with combatants for peace, 
okay. which is this wonderful organization of Israelis who have been in the military and have renounced military service, hmm. and Palestinians, many of whom were arrested and living in Israeli jails for many years. Some wow. even learned Hebrew there. And they've also renounced violence and hmm. armed conflict. And they founded this organization together. And I've now had five years of doing trainings with them once a year, wow. generally in the summer. And the past couple of years have been nonviolence training. Mm -hmm. And they also, I also sponsored two speaking tours when they came to the United States. Twice groups of them came to Amherst and Northampton. And the first time they spoke, it was in Rabbi Weiner's synagogue in the JCA. Sure. And I, yeah. I brought them there and oh. negotiated so with the rabbi. what year was that, roughly? Oh, it was about four years ago, I would okay. say. And I negotiated with the rabbi to have them. It was yeah. a difficult decision, but it was very positive. Yeah. The place was packed, and people loved it. They spoke beautifully. Huh. And then I brought them and I brought them to Hampshire College. Hmm. And the next year I brought them to um, CBI, Congregation okay, in, in Northampton, Beth Israel yeah. in Northampton. And they spoke there, and again, a very large and wonderful reception. Wow. And then there was a film made about them oh. called Disturbing the Peace, which is a great title for a film. Yeah. And we had a showing in the Amher Cinema for a night. Oh my gosh. And so we packed the Amher Cinema and I spoke there. Yeah. And I've also spoken in two or three other places where they've shown the film in Greenfields and Brattleboro. Okay. Where we've shown Disturbing it as well. Disturbing the Peace. So it's, to look that you can one look up. it up. You can see it on, on, uh, on your computer now. Yeah. And um, they've been a wonderful organization. So I've continued with them. Hmm. over the years and it's been very meaningful yeah. because they're doing they're doing um, a non-violent response to the violence that's brewing there yeah. and trying very hard to bring Israelis and Palestinians together and wow. because the organization is joint I've also facilitated some dialogue for them sure. so it's that's so that's really been a, that's excellent. a nice part of my life too yeah, yeah. and and what other parts of the world have have you been working in well, not at the moment, but I've worked a great deal in um, Sri Lanka and Nepal mm -hmm. and some in India and a little bit in Afghanistan, so mm -hmm. a lot in that South, Southeast yeah. Asia region. Um, and I've also worked a lot in Africa hmm. and a lot of African countries, especially in East and Central Africa, spent a long time in Rwanda, yeah. but also worked in Zambia and Tanzania and Uganda. I worked with Sudanese women from South Sudan and Sudan, wow. working on kind of a government track level with them. And we spent many years in the Balkans, Bosnia, mm. Macedonia, and Kosovo. Okay. And I've got another little spiritual home there because that was one of my first big projects with Karuna Center. Oh my. Was the Bosnia project, which was six years right after yeah, the war. So. Right after the war. And I've been back, and um, one of the people that I trained has opened his own NGO, which he calls the Center for Peace Building, named oh, after Karuna Center. Nice. And it's the next generation carrying on the work. That's, and, that's and what that's you And that's my are. job as an elder is to make sure the next generation's carrying it on and Absolutely. taking it forward. So that's been very rewarding, too. So the work itself, it seemed like from, you know, what I read, and it, seemed, it seems like there are these basic tenets Mm -hmm. Different parts that you uh, that make up the the whole work. Um, so you know it's creating the safety and doing the dialoguing, mm -hmm. and ending with training them to That's be right. continue yeah. on. But what are some of the steps in between? Well, there's a lot of other pieces to it. Yeah. Um, and when I was young and first doing this, I would come back from overseas and think. I guess it worked, but I'm just making it up. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that anymore. I know now exactly what I'm doing okay. and what the plans yeah. are. Um, a lot of it is um, helping people understand the causes of conflict. Because people in a post-conflict situation, civil society, people who show up at our workshops, are bewildered. How, how did we get here? Why did we kill each other? How did we get from living together decently enough to ravaging and wrecking each other's lives yeah. and what happens. So we try to do a lot of work at looking at the multiple and overlapping and complex causes of conflict so that people can find their way into how this conflict happens. Yeah. And we talk about conflict escalation hmm. and we talk about a lot about stereotypes and prejudice and how those are reinforced and, and the role of government as well as the role of civil society. Yeah. Um, and we try to talk a lot about cycles of revenge and how if people don't heal, hmm. 
<laughs> then the next generation will carry on and yeah. kill the other people, and then the next generation will kill the people who killed the people. Yeah. And you see that in Israel and Palestine sure. almost in real time. Yeah. But you see it in the history of many of these places. Yeah. Many of these places. Even our country. Totally our own country. Yeah. So we try to look at very deeply at, at, at these kinds of things in order to help people move away from that. Mm -hmm. We also do a lot of work on reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And forgiveness, and what does it mean to reconcile? It's a, it's. I think it's a whole lifetime process to mm -hmm, reconcile. Mm -hmm. But what are the steps, and how do people help themselves and help each other? And how do you raise kids not to carry the trauma of the adults? Yeah. So what's trauma, and how do you deal with that? Wow. So it's there's a lot of pieces, and a lot. different pieces come in in different contexts depending on where I'm invited, who the participants are, what yeah. the history of the war has been, how long ago it was, etc. Yeah. But these are all pieces that I've learned to teach and to help people. Oh, with. good. And, it, and they're all very important. And they're kind of things that nobody talks about. Wow. Yeah. You know, all they want to do is blame, you started the war. No, you started the war. Yeah. Who started the war? We don't Well, even probably know. they started the war over there between you two to give them the power. You know, there's it's, that piece, yeah, too. Exactly. It's divide and conquer. A lot of, div a lot of divisions. And yeah. you have to sort of, it's the bridging again. How do you mm. come back and bridge the divisions? Yeah. And we tend, when I'm overseas, you know, I try to do three to five days at a time because I've traveled a long way. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring people for a three or four day weekend and we'll work all day every day yeah. on these things with lots of small group work and activities and learning, practicing, so that people really have things they can take back. And we always end by a training of trainers group yeah. so that I feel when I'm gone, the work is going to be carried Good. on. Yeah, that's so important. Yeah. Wow. And another way that that's happened is your teaching right. at the uh, School of International right. Training. That's been wonderful for me. I just finished 20 years teaching there, 1995 wow. to 2015. Yeah. And it gave me an opportunity to bring the theory into the practice. Yeah. And it also gave the students an opportunity to hear about the practices in mm -hmm. different countries, because I'd come back from Bosnia and go teach a class. Wow. And I would say, well, here's, here's what's going on, and here's what we're trying to do, and here's why we're trying to yeah. do it. And here are some of the theories you're reading about that help us understand why we're doing this now and, and how what, we evaluate it. What's the CONTACT program that you found in The CONTACT there? is a wonderful program. CONTACT stands for Conflict Transformation Across Cultures. Oh. And it was a three-week summer institute in Vermont and a two-week win winter institute in Kathmandu, Nepal. Wow. And I started it because when I started teaching at SIT, I had just found the Karuna Center, and I was flying around to all these different countries. And I would say to the Sri Lankans, Palestinians are doing something very interesting. And I say to the Palestinians, well, here's what's going on in Bosnia. And I thought, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a little birdie, but I want them to talk to each other, not wow. through me. So I got this idea of bringing people together um, who have been in armed conflict to work with each other. And I brought it to the dean. He said, it's a great idea. Try it out. So we started in 1997 with our first program and with about 10 people, and before you know it, it was 60 or 70 people every summer. Okay, and these are people weeks. from different from countries. Zones, from all from over the war world. Zones. And who pays to get them to come? My begging bowl. <laughs> oh, it's, so they come for free. This I mean, some, well, nin, 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 nin. this one okay. pays, and you take something from this one, and you help this one. Okay. And, and a lot of them don't come because they can't afford it, yeah. but we, we wound up with very large groups. Wow. And very intense because the Americans, of course, were there where it didn't come from a direct war zone, but a lot of them have been working overseas because mm -hmm. it's a school for international training, and they go overseas for internships. And a lot of them have been in Peace Corps and other things. So yeah. people were very traumatized. Yeah. And we went very deep. And oftentimes there would be people from both sides of the conflict, like Israelis and Palestinians, yeah. in the same room. Sure. And it's three weeks, and I had wonderful staff and faculty who worked with me. And then mm. after um, the 9-11 events happened in this country, yeah. I couldn't get the Muslims in here anymore. I couldn't get the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Afghans. They didn't want them, the Bangladeshis, because lots of Because they others. couldn't get visas. They couldn't get visas. Yeah. So I, and I tried, and one year I accepted 10 Palestinian students and got 10 visa rejections, and I thought, oh, wow. this is not okay. This is So working. I started a second program in Nepal to bring in the South Asians. Oh. 
So then I had three weeks in the summer of contact in Vermont, and then two weeks in the winter in Kathmandu where I could bring in all these people that could get visas and come. Oh, so I had Pakistanis and Indians who haven't talked to each other for 70 years sitting up all night because they're oh. cousins, they're genetically sure. the same people. Of course. You know, split by a boundary. Yeah. And and people from Afghanistan who feel so isolated and so frightened wow. coming and talking to all these others. So it became another very rich experience for me. I have to say that this is more real to me lately because I run a conversation circle at the Jones Library for ESL speakers. Mm -hmm. And just the other day, I put people in small groups, and a woman from China and a woman from Japan wow. were talking to each other. And when they got back in the big group, they actually, the plan was they would introduce each other. Uh -huh. And the Japanese woman said, the, the Chinese is very nice. She's very, our countries yeah. were at war, but exactly. she's so exactly. nice. Yeah. And really, very often, I feel like we yeah. have we're doing a little of your same it's work. Wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's really I tried cool. very. I tried. I had a commitment to bring Tibetans in every year. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time working in the Tibetan community in North India and Dharamsala. So we'd always try to make special scholarships for Tibetans, which was very sweet. And some years we had Chinese. Yeah. There they were. And we also, I have a very nice connection with the Native American community mm. of uh, Navajo Diné from Arizona. And we had two scholarships for them every summer and brought them in. Wonderful. And most people around the world think there's no more indigenous people left in this country. So yeah. it was a thrill for them sure. to meet these indigenous people and wonderful for them to, to learn about the whole world mm -hmm. and for them to give their notions of what peace is to other people. It was wow. very sweet. That's really yeah. great. It's really great. So I'm just wondering, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to share or speak about? Well, yes. Um, our Hands Across the Hills program is going to have a website starting in a week or two, so people will be able to look about that. And we're putting some of the teachings about dialogue on it, as well as the whole experience oh, that fantastic. we shared. And, and we'll start doing some blogging. And, and my work now was to try to disseminate um, that program and to get other communities around the yeah. country to start um, trying dialogue. Right. And I've had a lot of requests from people who want me to come and speak to them. Oh, good. And I'm glad about that because yeah. I feel like it's, I want to be a little bit of a Johnny Appleseed around, around this business because our country is so stressed and so fractured. Yeah. And we need the humanity of the other. Right. And we can't let the media run our lives. Right. So, so that's what I'm embarking oh, on now fantastic. was a big dissemination and writing project to try to get this out and encourage more of it. That's great. Great. On so many layers of, you know, like I'm thinking it would be very good too for uh, curricula in schools. Yes. You know, yes. just all the yes. different Absolutely. ages. Yeah, it's, it's sort of endless. Yeah. But we'll do what yeah. we can do. Yeah. And I love the idea of it being really local. You know, mm -hmm. your, uh, your first attempts didn't yeah. go through, but mm -hmm. maybe there's ways. Uh, I think it's gonna happen. Yeah. I, think this, I think talking about the spirit, the spirit's gonna lead us. The, yeah. the, way, the way is opening, as the Quakers say, for this yeah. to happen. Oh, and there great. are many other dialogue projects in the country that we're discovering oh. that are doing the same thing oh, or similar good. things. So, that's, yeah. so I think there's an impetus in our country to not allow the media and the politicians to keep us divided and to yeah. do whatever we can to be compassionate with each other and understand why people vote the way they do. There's always a story. Right. You know, and that's what we learned from Kentucky. There was a reason that this happened, and yeah. we have to understand the reasons. Sure. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Paula, thank you so much. This has been a really very beautiful time with you, and I love your work. Oh, I, I do have one more question. Go for it. Well, just quickly, can you tell us what it was like to be with the Dalai Lama when you received your... Uh, it, was, it was kind of a melting experience. <laughs> they said to us ahead of time, there were 50 of us who received this award, wow. and they said, stay focused in the present moment. Just be there with him. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. Oh. And everybody went up, and they got a white scarf put around them, and you held his hands, for, held your hands for a few minutes. It was just glorious. Wow. Very, I, very tender. Just to back up, yeah. that you received this unsung Hero for Compassion right. Award in yeah. 2009, yeah. but you know, given to you by the yeah. Dalai it was Lama. A, it was a great thrill. That's lovely. Yeah. 
And you didn't have any clue you were I had being... not a clue. It came in an email and I thought it was a joke. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it was quite wonderful. Like April Fool's. Exactly, right. It was oh. a delicious joke. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to look for the photo of you. Yes, I sent you the... one. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks again for coming. And I also want to thank Amherst Media and thank the interns who work so hard. Uh, Amherst Media is in a wonderful growth uh, opportunity now with a new building in the, in the horizon. Mm. So let's all do our best to support them. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, when I was a little boy sitting on my mama's knee she said son let me tell you about that bad staggerly she said son he was a bad man Lord, the baddest man I know Well, he killed Billy Lyons With a blue steel 44